title of our sermon or my lesson tonight, Life in the Meantime. Life in the Meantime. You know, we all have high and low points in our lives. Moments where everything seems, you know, everything comes together to make us feel truly joyful, truly happy, you know, we're on top of the world. And then there are other moments, other times, that crush us, that bring us down, that bring us to an emotional place where we'd, we'd rather not be because of the pain and, and the sorrow. Uh, I experienced, like you, times like these. I remember one in particular several years ago when my cousin, uh, his name was Andre, uh, he was like a brother that I never had. I had no brothers or sisters, uh, only child. Some of you may know what that's like. So he was my cousin and he and I were like brothers. And I was away from Montreal. I wasn't living there at that time. And he was depressed and he was alone and he was having marriage problems and so on and so forth. And a family member called me up to tell me that he had committed suicide. Just, and that was a sad, I think the sad is not the word to describe that moment. That was a, a loss. Um, I remember at that moment uh, a pain that was so deep because a part of me was lost forever. He and I grew up together. There were things that we shared that we had and with his leaving, he was a young man in his 40s, uh, those things were gone forever and I remember weeping for him for a long time and mourning him a long time, a low moment. And then of course God provides good times, high points. You know, uh, our children are married, that's a high point. We're happy at that time of life or someone uh, graduates from college and we're very proud of of them for doing that. Uh, Lisa and I uh, experiencing a, a high point this year. Our, our four children, all of them are having babies this year. Our sons' wives are having babies and our daughters are having babies. Four little cousins, if Lord is willing, four little cousins, all born the same year. That's a high point. I mean, it doesn't happen a lot and it's, uh, having one grandchild is just marvelous, but having four in one year, we're truly, truly blessed. And so moments like these, you know, they come to everyone in some form or another, but thankfully in most of our lives they are separated by long stretches of what I call in the meantime. You know, in the meantime, between those highs and those lows, there's this in the meantime stuff that just kind of bumps along, a level road. I suppose we would all like to have nothing but mountain peak moments, but real life is not like Hollywood. In Hollywood you wonder how they can pack all that adventure in just two hours. Uh, usually they cover maybe two weeks of time in the movie and you wonder how could somebody go through all those high or low moments in, in a week or two weeks, but that's Hollywood, that's make-believe. Most of our lives are spent in the rather flat terrain of in the meantime moments where we're just taking care of business until the next high or the next low comes along. Now since the Bible is a composite of various episodes of people's lives, the writers usually provide us with either a burning bush-like moment or a deep in the valley type event in the lives of the Bible characters. You know, it doesn't tell us every day in the life of Abraham or every day in the life of Moses. The, the Bible gives us the high points or the low points in their lives. But I am persuaded that they, like us, probably had a lot of in the meantime moments in their long lives. For example, we read of Jesus' many miracles and teaching periods, but most of His actual time was spent walking. Think about that. 
80 odd miles between Galilee and the area around Jerusalem in the south where he conducted much of his ministry. And that was about 80 miles from one to the other. There was no train, there was no bus. They walked. And so he had a lot of those in the meantime days and weeks in between the high and low moments in his three years of public ministry. In other words, even Jesus had those in the meantime days. Well, my lesson tonight, I'd like to talk about the spiritual life that we experience, not when we're up on the high mountaintop, and not when we're brought low by trials and temptations, but rather the spiritual life that God gives us in between these points as we travel that in the meantime road. In other words, our spiritual life on the level road. Now there are not a lot of scriptures that talk about this particular time, but the one that does, does so very eloquently. Solomon refers to all of the times in our lives, including the in the meantime moments, in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter three. In this passage, he makes three claims about God and His sovereignty over all of our times, and I'd like to share a couple of these tonight. Three claims about God and time. Claim number one, God is the one that sets the times of our lives. I repeat, God is the one that sets the times of our lives. Let's read chapter three, beginning in verse one. He says, there is an appointed time for everything and there is a time for every event under heaven. Stop there. Note that he says that there is an appointed time. An appointed time. And not just stuff happens. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say stuff happens. The Bible says there is an appointed time. Note also that if there is an appointed time, then there must also be someone who appoints the time. Now the original Hebrew here, uh, the word was to fix, to fix something, to fix the time. And who do you think is the person that fixes the times? Well, God is the one who fixes the times. Let's keep reading verse two. It says, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Here Solomon reviews some of the key experiences common to all people. His point is that God is the one that fixes, that establishes, that sets, that appoints all of these times of our lives. It's okay for Lise and I to say, thank you God for blessing us with grandchildren and a special thank you for having blessed us in such an unusual way that four of them come our way in the same year, why? because God is the one who appoints this time of joy. Now, it would be easy to fall into the trap of thinking that life is all predetermined, it's all fate, you know, we have no control. But this is not what Solomon is saying. He's saying that God is sovereign over every period of our lives. 
He either directly works in human history, you know, like sending Jesus and all of the history that he has managed to bring Jesus uh, uh, onto the uh, historical scene, or he permits every event, whether good or bad, to occur in our lives. Has something bad happened to you, uh, perhaps? Well, know that God has permitted it to happen, no matter how bad it is, nothing happens without His permission, good or bad. In verse 11, just jump down for a moment, verse 11 he says, he, has, he speaking of God, He has made everything appropriate in its time. So here Solomon expresses the idea that everything that happens, happens according to God's timetable. He's made things appropriate, not only does he appoint the time, it's appropriate. The good times are right on time. The bad times are right when they're supposed to be. And the long stretches of in the meantime are not any longer than he permits. In verse 16, just jump down a few verses, he continues to say, Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness, and in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time, for every matter and for every deed is there. And so because He is sovereign, and sovereign over every time, God will judge all of the time that we have spent, whether it be much or little. He will judge all the highs, He will judge all the lows, and He will judge all the in-between times as well. And so, whether you're on the mountaintop, or you're in the valley, or simply in the meantime, the point I'm making here, the point that I believe Solomon is making here, is that God is aware of where you are because He has set the time of your life wherever you are. So God knows where you are and He has permitted you to be where you are because He has affixed all of the times of my life and your life as well. A second claim Solomon makes in this passage is this, about God and time. He says, God sets all of the times of our lives. And at the beginning I said, God sets all of the times, you know, the time, He sets the time. Now, the, the second thing I want to say is, God sets all the times. I want to focus on another word, same idea. If we go back to chapter uh, three verses one to eight, we note that Solomon covers the key moments in an entire lifetime. Obviously those are not all the things that happen to an individual. He just picks key moments that happen to all of us. We, are, we all are born, we're all, we all die, and sometimes we're, we're, you know, we're in a state of love, sometimes we're in a state of war. You know, he covers the big picture, if you wish. Um, a time to be born, a time to die. Well, we often think that God sends the good and the devil sends the bad, but listen to what Solomon says, this time in chapter seven. You have to kind of skip around a little bit. Go to chapter seven. We're still in the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter seven, verse 14. He says, in the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. You know, a good example of this, uh, of one who learned this lesson, was uh, Job. Job was happy, he was wealthy, he was righteous, recognizing that all the blessings that he had came from God. In other words, he was on the mountaintop for a long time. When adversity came, he didn't stop believing in God, we know that, but he did question God's justice in allowing his suffering. He did question God's time. Why are you doing this at this time? 
and why is this thing that has happened to me, why is it continuing for so long? Job knew that God was ultimately responsible for the good and the bad in permitting it to happen. His problem was in doubting God's wisdom in fixing a time for suffering in his life. In other words, Job thought that God's timing was off. Why this? Why now? Why me? He, he knew it came from God, he knew God permitted it, but he questioned God's timing, God's ability to fix a certain amount of suffering or joy in a person's life. And of course we knew that he learned later on that God's wisdom and power was so far beyond his own that to question it was a sign of foolishness and ignorance and pride. No matter how high, no matter how low, no matter how long in the, in the meantime, we need to recognize that God has fixed the height, the depth, as well as the length of time between both. And then a third claim about God and time made in this particular passage. God sets the correct time in our lives. He doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't fumble the ball. He doesn't confuse us with someone else. Again, we go back to Solomon in chapter three, verse 11 this time, where he says, he has made everything appropriate in its time. Bad things pile up and we say, wow, bad timing, wow, that was lousy timing. I remember the other night you know, when the tornado came through, and as you know, you know, Lisa and I are in the middle of a move, so we actually, we own two houses at the moment. One is sold, but we haven't closed on it. It's empty, we've moved everything out of it. And then we have this other house that we own also. We're waiting to you know, take care of that where all our furniture is at. So the tornado is coming and, and, and they're saying, you, know, you better get some shelter. Well, we have a tornado shelter, but it's in our house in Midwest City. There's nothing in the house, but. We, we drove over there in the middle of the storm and we grabbed pillows and whatever we needed. We were sitting half in and half out of the tornado and thankfully, a modern technology, we were watching on our phones, Gary England and all the other guys telling us about this tornado that was heading for Midwest City and then on to Spencer. And, and we looked at each other and we said, what are the odds that this tornado could take out both of our houses? <laughs> and I heard myself thinking, God wouldn't do that. <laughs> Would he? Tornado took out Job's house with all his kids inside of it. According to this lesson, if that tornado took out both houses, that time was fixed. I would not be able to go to God and say to Him, what are you doing? What's the matter with you? Don't you realize now I don't even have a house anymore? I mean, I could say that because I'm a sinful human being, but I wouldn't be right in saying that. So bad things pile up and we say, man, that was bad timing. And good things happen and we say, boy, I was just at the right time at the right place. And then boring, monotonous stretches happen and we say, well, same old, same old. What we don't realize and what Solomon is trying to teach us is that all of the times of our lives are the correct time for us from God's perspective not our perspective. There's no such thing as lousy timing. There's no such thing as great or lucky timing. There's no such thing as boring timing because all time is His time and it is correct by His schedule, not our schedule. And that's always the problem. We always want to impose 
our schedule. And we refuse to submit to his schedule. <laughs> Perhaps the hardest thing, he wouldn't turn out the lights on me, I know that, not in the middle of the sermon, no kidding. Perhaps the hardest thing for us to learn as finite beings with only 80 or so years of time on this earth is that God, who is beyond time, allots and controls all of the time that we are given whether we're given 15 years or 20 or 115 years, God is in charge of all of those years and He appoints the time from beginning to end. And if we could learn that lesson, how at peace we would be regardless of the time. Of course, not everyone ascribes to what Solomon in the Bible says about time that God sets the time in our lives, or that God sets all the times in our lives, or that God's timing is always correct. Not everybody you know, buys into that. The majority of the world doesn't believe in the God of Abraham and Jesus Christ, and their views of time are different. In the world, the view of time is, well, eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. That's what they say. Or life is short, so do it, whatever it is. Or they say, take your time and enjoy life. You only live once. That's, that's the wisdom of the world as far as time is concerned. But for disciples of Jesus Christ, the biblical view of time presents us with unique challenges in our lives and also for our faith. As far as being faithful is concerned, Solomon's view of time means, first of all, that we must try to discern God's time and God's timing in our lives. You know, one of the challenges of living by faith is that we try to know and submit to God's timetable for our lives. And you know what? This is difficult because even Solomon admits that God's timing is not always possible to know. Let's go to uh, chapter 11, verse five. And he says, just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Some people, you know, their favorite hobby is to try to figure out what God is thinking. Some folks think the preacher knows that. They ask questions as if we know what he's thinking. All we know is what he's written, and even that we're struggling to understand and to, to put forth in a clear way. He does say, however, that when you can understand and comply to his timing, there is great satisfaction. Chapter eight, verse five, he says, he who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. In other words, isn't it wonderful when you know exactly what God wants you to do and you do it? And you do it right when He wants you to do it? That's a tremendous uh, gift and a wonderfully satisfying experience as a Christian. In the end, living by faith involves a constant search for God's timing in our lives through prayer and through careful observation. And getting back to our original idea about life in the meantime, I think these long stretches of flat spiritual road afford us the best opportunities to meditate on the highs and the lows of the past and prepare us for the changes that will come inevitably, because inevitably there's always change in our lives. Another challenge for persons of faith concerning time is this, we must accept God's timing, I repeat, we must learn to accept God's timing. You know, Job got into trouble because he questioned God's timing for his suffering. Why now, why this, why me? It's not fair. And yet God's timing was perfect since Job had grown spiritually as much as a person could from being blessed. You ever think of that? He had grown, 
he couldn't grow anymore from being blessed. And so the next growth spurt spiritually that he had to make required suffering, not blessing. It was a time to learn a lesson about God that only suffering could teach, and he learned it. You know, sometimes when we suffer, we forget that there are things that we learn through suffering that are impossible to know in any other way. And if we were suffering in a vacuum, it would be terrible. But we are always suffering under the watchful eye of God who knows our suffering and who knows the limit of our capability for suffering. To defy God's timing for our lives is to put our own short lives into great danger. Solomon says, once again, do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Ecclesiastes 7, 17, I always think of all the quote, evil Knievels in the world, you know, uh, and what they do for life is they risk their lives for fame or for money. How foolish. I mean, you could, you know, one of our dear sisters in Christ here was visiting her brother and on her way to the vehicle in the garage, she lost her footing on one step. It was just one step down. She lost her footing on the step and fell down and bumped her head. Well, that bump on the head caused a concussion and that concussion took her life only two days later. It's so easy to die. <laughs> there are so many ways to die. Why would one be so foolish as to risk it on purpose? And Solomon reminds us of that. He says, do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? So free will allows us to thwart God's timing if we want, but never for the best, always for the worst. So my prayer to God when I am unsure of His will and His timing is this, Lord, please reveal your will, please reveal your plan, please reveal your timing to me so I do not use my own. Please let me see plan A for my life, not plan B. And then finally, another challenge for the faithful concerning God and time is this, we must live appropriately. To live by faith is to live in the moment that God gives us. Some people, you know, they say, oh, I'm living in the moment, and they're doing crazy things, and they're quitting their jobs, and they're draining their savings account to go to Bora Bora or something, you know, to see the other side of the world, because I'm living in the moment. But living in the moment is living by faith. That's living in the moment. Solomon explains this in verses two to eight in the third chapter when he says that there's a time to mourn, a time to laugh, a time to be born, a time to die. What's he talking about? He's talking about moments in our lives. We live by faith in the moment that God gives us. And so living by faith is to accept God's timing and mourn when it's time to mourn, and speak when it's time to speak, and build when it's time to build, and when the time comes to leave this place, when it's time to leave this place. We can do this because of faith in God. In chapter three, verse 11, Solomon says, and I repeat, he has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. In other words, we are limited as to time, and our best use of time is to know and submit to God's timing for our lives. But God has also created within us the ability to understand and grasp the concept of eternity. How wonderful! He creates us as beings that have a very short lifespan, but within us, He gives us the understanding of eternity. So we are temporal, physical beings with the understanding of eternity within us each day. What a, what a marvelous gift that is. The concept of an eternal, timeless God so that we are not prisoners of time, 
We see time as a way to know and glorify and honor God who made us as well as time itself. And so every time you live in God's moment, whether it's a high moment or a low moment or those long in-between time moments, you acknowledge your ultimate freedom from time constraints. A freedom that will come when Jesus returns, bringing with Him the end of time. And so time spent in the meantime, pursuing the will of God in everyday matters, the timing of God in the long stretches between key events in life, this is not wasted time, but rather the very essence of our faith. That's what faith is all about, finding out what God wants from us at this moment in time. It's easy to be faithful on the Mount of Transfiguration or in the boat during the raging storm with the Lord, but walking the lonely back roads with Jesus, keeping time, this is the true test of faith. This is the real place of challenge for not losing our way. Most people lose their faith, not on the mountaintop and not in the valley. They just get careless during the long, boring stretches in between. And so, regardless of where you are, high, low, or in the meantime, I encourage you to accept God's timing for you, whatever that is for you. And regardless of the time of your life, it is always the right time to confess your faith to repent of your sins, to be baptized and wash those sins away forever. That time is always correct. And it's always the right time for you to be restored or request prayers for assistance. And it's always the right time to commit yourself and your family to being members with us here at the Choctaw congregations. So I ask you tonight, please search your hearts and see what God's timing is for you tonight. And if you need to respond to Him, His timing, the time that He has affixed for you this night, then we encourage you to do so as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement. <laughs>